Greetings, everyone, and welcome to THE 507, Lecture 3A, where we look at the Jewish schools of thought, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes, the three schools of thought that the historian Josephus describes for us, and two of which we encounter prominently on the pages of the New Testament, namely the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Because Jesus' life and ministry had a lot to do with his interaction with and opposition from the Sadducees and especially the Pharisees, it's important to do the best job we can of fleshing out who these groups were, what their motivations and goals were, so that we can see uh, what sort of conflict, why they came into conflict with Jesus, and how he views his own program for Israel as differing from theirs. I want to start with a word about what it means to be a school of thought, and that is to make clear it doesn't mean it's, it's not equivalent to modern denominations. Today we might speak of Orthodox or Reformed Judaism, and everyone falls into some category, either Orthodox or Conservative or Reformed, or in Christianity, people are Catholic or they're Presbyterian. Um, there are, of course, non-denominational Christians, but most people would fall into some denomination. The schools of thought here are not like denominations. Most Jews weren't any of these three things. This can be illustrated strikingly by the fact that the population of the Jews in the Roman Empire has been estimated at in the range of 7 million, which is actually quite large, and Jews in Palestine between half a million and two and a half million. And yet Josephus gives us as the number of Pharisees 6,000 and Essenes 4,000. So these are really quite small groups. Very few people would have belonged to them. You would have just been an Israelite. And I want to illustrate this graphically in, to make one slightly different point, and that is that you could be a priest with or without being a Pharisee, a Sadducee, or an Essene. So the larger box here is the Israelites, the Jews. And Within this group, there are priests, and this is a matter of ethnicity, or lineage, I should say. You have to be of the tribe of Levi, the priestly tribe, and you need to be trained for and practicing the priesthood. You're primarily an expert butcher, a leader in Jerusalem who goes from time to time to administer sacrifices in the temple. As uh, In fulfilling that role, you would not need to subscribe to any particular outlook in terms of Jewish thought and practice, you could. You could be a Pharisee and a priest, or a Pharisee and not a priest, or a priest and not any of the above. Likewise for Sadducees and Essenes. Having said a, a few words um, by, by way of indicating that these uh, are not like the dominant three views in ancient Judaism, we want to say a bit about why they exist at all. Why were there schools of thought? And I think to get at that, we can start with some simple propositions and note that all Jews in the ancient world, including Israelites in biblical times, were unanimous that God's law was a good gift for Israel, was a source of joy and light and life. Of the hundreds of passages we could quote to illustrate this, we'll just give one. Psalm 19 praises that the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. If you want an even more fulsome praise of the law, you can look at Psalm 119, the longest psalm, all about the manifold goodness of the law, the freedom that the law gives to the heart, and so on. It's worth dwelling on this just a little bit because there can be a tendency in contemporary Christian thought and sometimes even in Christian scholarship to imagine that the law was some sort of burden or hard thing or that it was complicated. But all of our testimonies about the law from ancient Jews were that the law was a joy and easy to follow and a pleasure. Having said that, the law will also be the source of some diversity because it requires interpretation. 
So we can illustrate this by taking a commandment roughly at random. Let's take an important one, the commandment for the Sabbath. Deuteronomy 5 says, observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not do any work. Pretty clear, pretty important. God goes on to say that if you don't observe the Sabbath, I'll spit you out of the land, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we want to get this right. But you'll notice it doesn't say what constitutes work. Like, what if I stay home from the office, but I do a bit of cleaning around the house? Does housework count? Can I cook a meal? Uh, you can see why the rabbis would later say that the Sabbath is like a mountain hanging by a thread. It's like a mountain because it's so important. So much hinges on getting it right. But it's like it's hanging by a thread because there's only a couple passages in the books of Moses that flesh out what does or does not count as work. So the debates about how to interpret work are what are called halakha, or in the plural, halachot. Halach in Hebrew means to walk or to proceed, or to conduct oneself. And so the halakha on the Sabbath would say, for instance, if I said, you can walk a thousand cubits, and someone else said, no, you can walk two thousand cubits before it counts as work, that would be us debating about the halakha. So there's going to be different interpretations, and this is going to lead to rival schools of thought. And of course, the law is not only Moses' law is not only full of precepts, like the commandment about the Sabbath, but the, the contents of the Bible also include theological things. So let's ask the, the sort of matter about which there could be disagreement in the Old Testament. Is there life after death? Well, we don't hear anything about it in the books of Moses, but Ecclesiastes seems to pretty much settle the issue. There's no life after death. The fate of humans and the fate of animals is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Okay, now we can see, now, now we're going to go from this to so, so sort of some unclarities in the law, things that need to be determined. From this derives the different schools of thought. And we'll let this question of life after death be our segue to the school of thought about which we know the least, namely the Sadducees, because when we find the Sadducees on the pages of the New Testament or in Josephus, they are denying afterlife. They seem to have agreed with the book of Ecclesiastes on this point. And I'll just tease out their argument here in, as we find it in the Gospel of Mark because it can be a little confusing. In the Gospel of Mark, some Sadducees approach Jesus. Mark notes for his readers that the Sadducees say there is no resurrection. And they pose a sort of riddle for Jesus. Teacher, Moses wrote for us, so they're citing Deuteronomy 25 here. Moses wrote that if a man's brother dies, leaving him a wife but no child, then that man, then a man shall marry the widow and raise up for children for his brother. Okay, that's lever at marriage. The brother dies without a child, you have to marry his widow so that you raise up kids for the dead man. But they pose a, a puzzle here. What if there were seven brothers? What's going to happen in the resurrection? This would be incredibly awkward. Hey, welcome to the resurrection. Who's married to this woman? They were all married to her. Does she have seven husbands in the resurrection? That's a reductio ad absurdum. Obviously, she can't have seven husbands in the resurrection. Therefore, Moses' commandment takes for granted that there is no resurrection. Otherwise, it would lead to an absurdity. That's their argument. Jesus counters, somewhat surprisingly perhaps, he says, first of all, you don't understand scripture and you don't understand God's power. You're working from the misapprehension that there will be any marriage in the resurrection. In fact, Jesus says, in the resurrection, people will be like the angels in heaven. Now, of course, the, Pharise the Sadducees don't even believe in angels, so they're probably grumbling and gnashing their teeth at this point. But then Jesus makes an argument based on an authority that they will certainly recognize. He bases it on Exodus. And it's rather subtle here. Jesus says, think about what it says in the books of Moses. God said, I am the God, am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's a statement from scripture. 
Here's then a steadfast theological premise. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Therefore, and Jesus doesn't draw the conclusion, but he thinks it's obvious. If God's the God of the living, and God says he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and those three patriarchs are currently dead, then they must be going to live. Otherwise, how could God be their God while being the God of the living? Such is Jesus' argument with the Sadducees about resurrection from the dead. Now, you might ask yourself here, why didn't Jesus cite you know, Ezekiel 37, this passage about uh, people, bones, dry bones being brought back to life? Or why didn't he cite Daniel 12, where Daniel says, those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life? Good question. It's possible that Jesus didn't think the book of Daniel, maybe even the book of Ezekiel, would carry weight with the Sadducees. Not sure. We're mentioning the Sadducees first because they are the group of these three that we know the least about. We don't have any Sadducean documents. There's no, no work that survives from Second Temple Judaism written by someone known to be a Sadducee. We don't even really know where they derived their name, presumably from the name Sadoc, the name of a prominent priestly family, but even that is uncertain. It could be from Tzedek, word for righteousness. And to just recapitulate what Josephus says in summary, they look like biblical traditionalists. In the books of Moses, there is no notion of fate. They just say, God leaves choice up to people. Moses says, I put before you life and death. Choose life. There's no notion of fate. There is no afterlife. There's no rewards and punishments. The Sadducees probably viewed all the rest of the Jews as having succumbed to the temptation of Greek notions of post-mortem reward and punishment. So the Sadducees probably took the view, we're the traditionalists. It doesn't say nothing about afterlife in the Bible, at least nothing fully clear. So we're sticking with that. And according, in, in, in like manner, this, according to Josephus, the Sadducees rely on the written law. And that means they don't accept Pharisaic oral traditions. I'll say more about those momentarily. In the New Testament, when we find this Pharisees, uh, the Sadducees, we encounter them in the company of the priests or the temple aristocracy. Again, they're not all priests, but it is noteworthy that they do keep appearing in that company. So much for the Sadducees, that's about all we can say about them. If we turn to the Pharisees, we can start with Josephus's description of them. Josephus summarizes their beliefs as insisting on the soul's post-mortem existence. He describes their belief in the afterlife a little like Platonic or Pythagorean transmigration of the soul. Now, of course, Josephus is writing for a Roman audience and he's trying to make these Jewish beliefs intelligible. So it's not entirely clear whether the Pharisees themselves would describe their belief that way. But Josephus says, they imagine the soul seeks a better abode after death. He says they believe in fate or providence, but they do carve out a freedom for the will. They're not utter determinists. This statement by Josephus is confirmed by a passage in the Mishnah, which says that all things are in the hand of God except for fear of God. In other words, God does not also predestine one's religious belief, one's accepting of God or rejecting of God. That's up to the individual. The overwhelmingly consistent message about the Pharisees, both from Josephus and from the pages of the New Testament, is that they are known as being punctilious interpreters of the law. This is Josephus' summary, and in every turn in the New Testament, we find them being described as precise or exacting in their interpretation of law. Paul himself, when he wants to boast about what a good law follower he was before he came to Christ, says, in terms of my law practice, I was a Pharisee. Most strikingly, perhaps, in the very passage in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus upbraids the Pharisees, 
he starts with a remarkable statement, and one that gets overlooked. He says to his followers, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on the seat of Moses, so practice and observe whatever they tell you. Just don't do what they do. In other words, Jesus says they get the halakha right, so do it. In fact, do it better than they do it. His critique isn't their teaching, it's their conduct. That's a topic we'll need to take up in a little more detail when we look at the Gospel of Matthew and think about Jesus' message. But Matthew seems to think Jesus and the Pharisees have quite a lot in common in their interpretation of law, which might explain why they fight so fiercely. If we wanted to sum up what the Pharisees were striving for, we could follow the lead of a major study by Jacob Nusner, who says that the Pharisees as a group were joined by the conviction about eating of food under ordinary circumstances in accord with cultic rules once applicable to the temple alone. Now, I want to tease that out a little bit. In the Mosaic Law, there are all sorts of cultic rules which don't apply to every time and every place. They apply to the priests in the temple. Priests need to be in a special state of cultic purity to officiate in the temple. That doesn't mean, according to God's will, as expressed in the Law of Moses, that everyone needs to be in that state of purity all the time. In fact, quite to the contrary, and this is important, it is God's will that you be impure some of the time. There's nothing sinful about being impure. To give a classic example, God says, be fruitful and multiply. Genesis 1.28, in other words, have kids. Childbirth is a wonderful thing. And yet, when a woman has a child, she is ritually impure for a period of time. 40 days for a boy, 80 days for a girl. It's not sinful for her to be impure. The only thing that would be morally wrong, sinful, would be to enter the temple while she's impure. There are lots of examples of this. Um, it is a sacred duty to bury your parents. But when you bury your parents, you do acquire corpse impurity. You can't just parade right into the temple on the same day because you have an impurity. It's not sinful. It's easy to take care of. You wait seven days, you bathe, you go through certain sacrifices, and then you're clean again. So what the Pharisees seem to have done is made a democratization of the sanctity of the priests in the temple and said, if a little bit of that holiness, God says, be holy like I am holy in Leviticus. If a little bit of holiness is a good thing, why don't we just have a lot of holiness? Why don't we just live as holy as the priests all the time? Why don't we imagine all space is as holy as the temple? And all of us live like a kingdom of priests. You can see that they share with the early Christian movement this idea that all space should be sanctified. But they draw some different conclusions about which precepts are important for sanctifying all time and space. And the one that they seem to be most concerned with is eating in ritual purity. So it's not surprising that we find Jesus being reprimanded by the Pharisees for eating with sinners. We'll talk more about eating and eating with sinners when we look more closely at Jesus' ministry. But to come back to Nusner's summary of the Pharisees, he suggests that they had not only their eating rules, but their other rules were meant to form a protective boundary. And it's possible that even their name, Paris Pharisee, would come from the Hebrew, Pushim, which would mean separated ones, separatists. That's uncertain as an etymology, but it's a likely etymology. So Pharisees are concerned with what will be called building a wall around the Torah, a hedge. Let's make extra sure we don't break these rules. Let's, let's bring holiness everywhere. We want to add a third characteristic to the Pharisees, and that is that both Josephus and the New Testament say that they follow the traditions of the elders. What does that mean? Well, it means that, quote Josephus here first, the Pharisees had passed on certain regulations handed down by former generations and not recorded in the laws of Moses. How important were these 
extra canonical regulations? Well, a passage from the Mishnah says it's more culpable to teach against the ordinances of the scribes than against Torah itself. That's stated hyperbolically, but it's hyperbole for a reason. It's meant to say um, we really take the oral Torah seriously. The idea is that God gave Moses two Torahs on Mount Sinai, a written Torah and an oral Torah. What's the oral Torah for? It's to explain all those difficult ambiguities in the written Torah. So the written Torah just says observe the Sabbath. The oral Torah, praise be to God, fleshes out what constitutes work. Can you, can you light the stove? Can you walk a thousand cubits or two thousand? Can you pull your ox out of the ditch, etc., etc.? Now, this is a myth, um, but it's one that had you know, some people believed in it. And the idea is that these aren't Pharisaical innovations. They're traditions that have been handed down from the time of Moses. God gave us both sets of commandments. The quotation that's up here is also from the Mishnah, from a tractate called the, the Chapters of the Fathers. And it imagines that the, the oral Torah is given to Moses and then handed down generation to generation to named Pharisees, Hillel and Shammai, the generation before Jesus. I want to sort of change gears here slightly. We will see that Jesus fights with the Pharisees about their oral traditions. So he addresses one um, where you're allowed to declare something korban, holy to God, sacred. And if it's holy to God, then you don't have to give it to your parents. I want to note that several of Hillel's traditions were, I think, what we would call quite charitable traditions. They were actually meant to make the law easier, not harder. So we think of the Pharisees as super, super strict. It would probably be more accurate to say they're super, super uh, punctilious and precise. In fact, they were not always strict. They were sometimes, in a sense, lenient. And I'll give an illustration. Uh, one of Hillel's innovations, and he wouldn't call it an innovation. They'd say this is oral Torah. But one of the innovations had to do with the law of the Sabbath year. And the law of the Sabbath year is that debts are forgiven. So just like there's seven days in a week, there's seven year, cycles of seven years. And in the seventh year, according to Moses, you have to forgive debts. That's obviously meant to protect the poor and to protect people from falling deep into debt poverty, debt. But it has an unintended consequence. Imagine a scenario where I come to you in year six and I'm poor and I need a loan. I need a thousand bucks. You're tempted to say, wait a minute, come next year, I'm going to have to forgive this debt. This guy's not going to repay it which means you're not going to want to give the loan. So a law intended to protect the poor starts to hurt the poor because they can't get loans in the year before the Sabbath year. So Hillel just made an innovation and said, you're allowed to write this special document called a prosbul, which circum circumvents the Sabbath year. There's a case of a Jewish teacher, Hillel, trying to get at the heart of what he thinks the, the point of Torah is. The point of Torah was to protect the poor, and for heaven's sakes, folks, we're not going to let this law become a noose around our necks and, and let it be practiced in such a way that it does the opposite of its intention. Now, I tell that story for two reasons. One, because when we get to the Essenes, we will see why the Essenes think the Pharisees are actually slackers when it comes to the law. Two, it's important because then when we, see, when we see Jesus giving his teachings about what he thinks is important in Torah, when, he, when, we, when we find him saying, folks, the point of Sabbath is such and such, it's helpful because we can see that he is speaking in a way that would be familiar to Jews. Ah, this is how a major religious teacher uh, teaches. He puts forth his platform about what counts in law, what are the major principles? What are the minor principles? What does holiness look like? It wouldn't strike their ears. It wouldn't strike anyone's ears like, ah, he's annulling Sabbath. That's absurd. Of course you don't annul Sabbath. That's a commandment given by God. 
what you do is you explain what it means to practice Sabbath. So Jesus comes in some ways in the tradition of people like Hillel as major reformers. I want to give just one colorful story about Hillel before we quit. Two, two colorful stories before we move on. Uh, one, we have Hillel basically saying, make yourself a disciple of Torah. So he's, he cries out to people on their way to work. What are you really going to earn? And they say, ah, 10 bucks, 20 bucks. And he says, would you not rather come and make Torah your possession that you may possess both this world and the world to come? Come study Torah and inherit real life. It's a little like Jesus issuing a cry to follow him and learn what true life is. Not quite the same, but you can see a family resemblance. And finally, a story that's both amusing and has an interesting parallel with Jesus. Hillel and Shammai are always paired in these stories, and Shammai is like the, the hard nut to crack. Hillel is more charitable. So here's a funny story. A certain heathen comes before Shammai and said, I'll convert to Judaism if you can teach me the whole Torah while standing on one foot. And Shammai says, you cheeky jerk, and he smacks him in the head with a measuring rod. The same heathen comes to Hillel, and Hillel says, all right, buddy, I'll take your challenge. And Hillel stands on one foot and says, okay, you want me to teach you the whole Torah on one foot? What is hateful to you, don't do to your neighbor. That's the whole Torah. The rest is just commentary. You can see that's a little like Jesus saying, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is the law and the prophets. The notion of finding the chief principle in Torah so that all the other commandments are merely expositions of what it means to carry out this chief principle. This is current in Jesus' day. We will conclude here our discussion of the Pharisees and note that we'll have further occasion to look more closely at the Pharisaic program because they are prominent in Jesus' ministry. We turn now to a really fascinating group, the Essenes, a group that does not appear, at least not as a named group, on the pages of the New Testament. And in the case of the Essenes, we have what is in all likelihood some of their own writings, that is the text from the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So let me say a bit about the Essenes and talk about also the Dead Sea Scrolls because the scrolls are important for our understanding of Judaism and making sense of the diversity of Judaism in the first century, in the time of Jesus and Paul. You will hear the scrolls talked about, so it's important to know what they are, how they were discovered, what sorts of writings they contain. So, an introduction. Here's a map of the Dead Sea, and on the northwest corner is a site called Qumran, where scrolls were discovered in 1947 by some Bedouin tending their sheep. Bedouin discovered seven scrolls in a cave, and this would later be called Cave One because it was the first to be discovered. But in the subsequent years, 10 more caves and ruins were discovered, both by Bedouin and also by archeologists now. Some of the most important documents were discovered here in Cave Four, and nearby was discovered the remains of a settlement. Now, everything I'm about to say is somewhat controversial because there are other ways of understanding the archeology span and the scrolls, but we need to keep this as straightforward as possible. So I'll present uh, the prevailing hypothesis. We have texts from Qumran, and they can be conveniently clustered by their genre. So the writings in the 11 different caves from Qumran can be clustered by genres which include biblical texts, that is simply Hebrew copies and sometimes Aramaic copies of books of the Hebrew Bible. This is a really precious find because it means that whereas prior to the discovery of Qumran, the oldest Hebrew copy of the Old Testament was medieval. And with the discovery of Qumran, we got a first century, sometimes even first century BC, Hebrew texts of the books of the Old Testament. Parts of almost every book survive in Hebrew, in Aramaic, and even in Greek. 
There are also apocryphal biblical works, like Book of Jubilees or First Enoch. There are commentaries, and these will be important because they're somewhat like the way early Christians comment on Scripture. These are called pesherim, for the Hebrew pesher, which just means interpretation. And so they'll be described as 1Q Pesher Habakkuk. That is, the Pesher on the biblical book Habakkuk from Cave 1 of Qumran. 1Q Pesher Habakkuk. These texts I'll say more about at a later date, but they will give a little passage of scripture and then say, Pishro, it's Pesher. It's Pesher is, and they apply the texts to the life of their own community. They say this is being fulfilled right now in this way. There are collections of testimonies. So these are called florilegium, florilegia plural. And this might be one prophetic passage followed by another, followed by another from various different books of the Old Testament. What's really nifty here is that they often strung together the same passages we find strung together in early Christian sermons. And this isn't because the Christians were from Qumran or Qumran had Christians added or anything like that. It's simply that in every generation, this is true, certain texts surface as the most exciting ones, the most controversial ones, the ones that everyone's fussing about and trying to make sense of. There are hymnals, basically, early hymnals, and they're called hodayot, books of praise. There's songs for the Sabbath. One of the most intriguing features of these songs is that they imagine that the angels are present at their worship. And what they've done here is they've taken these passages in the Old Testament, occasionally get a glimpse of heaven. So, for instance, the prophet Isaiah sees into the, the throne room of God, and there are holy beings in there, and the holy beings are often singing. They're singing some sort of praise to God. Well, Qumran folks imagine when we sing our praises, our voices are mingling with the angelic voices. The angels are with us singing hymns to God. And finally, there's literature about the group. So I've asked you to read sections from the rule of the community, 1QS, Serak Hayacha, the rule of the community. There's a Damascus document, tells about the history of the community. There's a war scroll, which spells out what the eschatological battle with the forces of darkness and the Romans will look like. There's a temple scroll which says what the temple will be like when it's finally perfect. And there's a list of works of Torah, which I'll say more about shortly. This literature, I haven't even included really strange documents like 3Q Copper Scroll, which is uh, contained in the, in the following was found in the following type of face. 3Q copper is literally a treasure list. In the filled tank, which is underneath the steps, there's 42 talents of silver. That, by the way, is a lot of money. In the cellar, which is in Matthias' courtyard, there's wood in the middle of it and in the middle of a cistern. In that, there are 70 talents of silver. Whoa, this is really weird. This is a scroll inscribed on copper with this treasure list. And people have been looking for this treasure because it's a lot of money. Uh, anyway, we won't talk about some of the more cryptic documents. Mainly we want to focus on, you know, here's just an illustration of the beautiful Isaiah scroll. 11 meters long when fully unfurled. You can see, actually, if you look closely, the stitching between sheets of parchment. And handwriting so clear that if you've even had a year or so of Hebrew, you can read it pretty well. It's almost exactly like the text of Isaiah you'll find in a critical Hebrew text printed today. Anyway, Dead Sea Scrolls are really wonderful and fascinating. Um, I wish we could talk more about each of these different categories, but we need to major on the majors. And I just want to note that whenever you hear about the scrolls, you get this kind of sensationalism. Uh, to cite a particularly grievous example, a book written by two, um, not biblical scholars, but Two journalists called the Dead Sea Scrolls Deception, 1992. Let me give you a little flavor of intimations of secrecy and uh, 
mystery. Might these texts, issuing so close to the source, and unlike the New Testament, never having been tampered with, might they shed some light on so-called early church and on Jesus himself? Might they contain something huh, compromising, something possibly that refutes established traditions? Oh, very exciting, very sensationalist. Uh, this is the sort of thing you get in Dan Brown and uh, whatever that novel is called, which is a great novel, but doesn't understand much about the scrolls. All right, folks, here we go. Let's dip in and let's see if there's something here that the Roman Catholic Church tried to suppress. I give to you 4QMMT, some works of the law. Let's see what all the hubbub is about and whether the Catholic Church could survive this sort of revelation. We have segregated ourselves from the rest of the people, and we have written that you must understand the book of Moses and the prophets and David and the annals of each generation. We have written to you some of the works of Torah, for this is the end of days. Well, this sounds exciting. So this is this is this sectarian group writing to the normal Jews in Jerusalem and saying, here are some works of Torah. We're telling you about some things. Here's some secret things. It is the end of days. Here we go. Buckle up. Even flowing liquids cannot separate unclean from clean because the moisture of flowing liquids and their containers is the same moisture. Now, I'm not making this up, folks. This is what this group, sensing that they were living in the end of days and that it was of paramount importance to rightly interpret Torah, they write to Jerusalem and to everyday Jews, normal Jews, and say, folks, you are getting the whole business about which vessels are clean and unclean all wrong. Liquids cannot separate. This is a very fine-grained halakhic dispute. I'll just tease this out so you see what they're talking about. But this is the sort of stuff that Dead Sea Scrolls is full of, and presumably is not something the Roman Catholic Church was especially anxious to cover up. It is a precious glimpse into the life and the tumult of ancient Jewish, real-life halakhic dispute. How do we interpret Torah properly? Just so you understand what it was they were talking about here, you've got a pure cup, you've got an impure pitcher. That's clear enough, and obviously if you touch the two together, the cup gets the impurity from the pitcher, and so you couldn't use the cup and still be ritually pure. But here's a question that the books of Moses don't entertain, so you have to make a halakhic decision. What happens when you pour from the pitcher to the cup? Does impurity travel along the stream? Their answer is, impurity does travel along an unbroken stream. Duh. What's interesting here is that it's the end of days, and they are trying so hard to get Torah right that they write a letter to Jerusalem saying, folks, you need to pay attention to this. We have an inspired prophet here who has told us how to do Torah correctly, and we're letting you know. Now, is that content that you know, the Roman Catholic Church was trying to suppress or that somehow is a threat to Christian orthodoxy, it seems quite unlikely. It's actually the sort of thing that's of interest to scholars of Second Temple Judaism and early Christianity because it fleshes out the contours of ancient Jewish sectarianism. To come back to the main thread of the story, how do we know that the scrolls are connected with the group Josephus describes as the Essenes. It's not 100% clear, but the basic argument's like this. If you look at the content of the sectarian scrolls, that is things like 1QS that you read, it describes rules, it describes a two-year initiation with stages, it describes eating sacred meals, uh, a set of other rules for expulsions and so on. Those rules seem to match Josephus's and others' descriptions of the Essenes. And so that would make you think that the scrolls, the texts, belong to the group described by Josephus. How do we connect the ruins? Well, the ruins are in the right place, pretty close to the right place, 
to where the ancient historian Pliny says a group called Essene were living. And that would lead us to think that the site is an Essene site. And if the site is of the group called the Essenes and the scrolls are Essene, we can probably use the scrolls and the descriptions of the Essenes to mutually interpret. To conclude by sort of noting some distinctive features of the Essenes, here are some that strike me as most important. At the heart of it all, they share with most other brands of Judaism a concern to get the law of Moses right, but there's a, there's a twist, and that is that they think the interpretation of the law of Moses was revealed to the sons of Zadok, that is, a priestly family, and above all, was revealed to a figure whom they call the teacher of righteousness. So they're saying, all these mysteries in scripture, we've got the answer because God sent us a teacher of righteousness, a righteous teacher. And he, along with the team of the sons of Zadok, tell us what the laws of Moses mean. So we live properly because now we know the secrets of Torah. According to 1QS, they segregated themselves to carry out a biblical prophecy. And what's just kind of interesting here is which biblical prophecy they think they're carrying out. It might sound familiar. They describe themselves in the third person here. They are segregated from the dwelling of the men of sin to walk in the desert in order there to open there God's path, just as it is written. And they quote here Isaiah 40, verse 3. Prepare the way of the Lord in the desert straighten in the step in the in the wilderness a roadway for our god this is the study of the law that means they're seizing on isaiah 43 in the wilderness as trying to be a community that gets things right enough that they can make god's path open so that god comes they describe in language reminiscent of john the baptist the idea that God would do something eschatologically to transform people. So they say, at the season of visitation, God will purge by his truth all the deeds of man, refining, literally burning for himself, some of mankind, but this is a good burning, refining them in order to remove every evil spirit from the midst of their flesh, to cleanse them with the Holy Spirit from all wicked practices and to sprinkle them with a spirit of truth like purifying water. In other words, we're going to come here and work hard at getting Torah right, and God at one point is going to visit us and burn the nastiness out of us so that we can be utterly pure. By his Holy Spirit, he will purify us. Does it sound like anyone you can think of from the pages of the New Testament? Well, it sounds a little like John the Baptist, who shows up in the wilderness, quoting Isaiah 40, verse 3, and saying he's preparing the way of the Lord by demanding a purity and holiness. And he speaks about one who's coming with a Holy Spirit like a refining fire. Interesting. Doesn't mean John the Baptist is an Essene. Doesn't mean John was from the Essene community or something like that. I think the better way to interpret it is that to, you can see various Jewish groups sensed it was the last days, that God was potentially going to act momentously to transform Israel or some portion of Israel. And we can see that John and Jesus, whom John baptizes, fit into this framework or would have been understood by their fellow Jews as another group calling for a special holiness and predicting the imminent activity of God. To say just another word or two about the Essenes, we've already spoken about 4QMMT. I just want to say a word about piety and legalism, and I'm going to come back to this at other points because 
it's really important not to think of Judaism as legalistic. And on the one hand, we would think of this group as the most legalistic group we could imagine. After all, they are fussing about even whether liquid flowing from one vessel to another will carry ritual impurity. I'll give you a schema later where I define sort of legalism one, legalism two. That is a fussiness or punctiliousness about Torah. But the other way legalism often gets defined is as an ugly sense of human striving to make oneself good enough for God. That is, it's, it's trying to turn Torah into a ladder and to climb to God by deeds of human righteousness. And it's really important to recognize that there is no version of Judaism from the ancient world known to us that fits that definition of legalism. I'll say that again in other lectures because it's really important. If we look at this group from Qumran, are they trying to get Torah right? Absolutely. Do they think they're making themselves good enough for God? Absolutely not. So here we read from 1Q11, and you just will note the piety here is one of humility. I belong to evil humankind. My failings, my transgressions, my sins, the depravities of my heart belong to the assembly of worms. What is man among all your marvelous deeds, God? We are but maggots food, spat saliva, molded clay. We long for dust. Here, the member of Qumran confesses he's full of sin. He's but nothing. And his full conviction is that God, in God's mercy, will save him. Why? God will free my soul from the pit and make my steps steady. God will draw me near in his mercy, not because I deserve it, because God is merciful. By his kindness, he will judge me. He will judge me in the justice of his truth and in his plentiful goodness, he will atone for my sins. He'll cleanse me from the uncleanness of, human, of being a human being and from the sin of the sons of man. I just conclude there by saying that it's important to know that in the same set of people, you could have both a desire to follow the laws of Moses as had been revealed according to the sons of Zadok, and also a sense that God is merciful and that God will do the atoning. This group didn't even go to the temple. They viewed their own community as a spiritual temple, but they were just confident that God was merciful, and that runs tr tr is true for every permutation of Judaism known to us. This means that in the next lecture, when we turn to Jesus of Nazareth, it's important not to think against a dark backdrop of sinister Jews who think they have to work their way to God. Jesus came pre preaching something no one had ever thought of before, that God was loving. Uh, that's not the case. Jesus enters a complex field of Judaism full of different groups saying and emphasizing this or that trend in scripture, but all in agreement that God had acted mercifully toward Israel by electing Israel, and that God continued to act mercifully by sustaining the country. Therefore, we will have to press hard to figure out what is it about Jesus' message that ruffled feathers. That's the topic of our next lecture, and look forward to continuing at that point.